All right, and all the Zoom people can hear me fine. I'm not gonna adjust my microphone at all. Okay. All right, so I'll try to talk to Zoom people and to, to real people at the same time. Um, so the title, the title of this discussion uh, is very unimaginative. Why work? So I'm gonna try to kind of give some background to the way that I understand how this, like this particular conversation tonight, kind of came about. Because really, it's the culmination of a conversation that different people have been having on and off for about a year now. So it's kind of like an ongoing conversation that we want to open up to everybody. Uh, so to kind of give a little background, a little context. Um, so Jay kind of pitched the idea about to talk about work and Christian discernment. So just to kind of preface, like so the problem, you know, uh, we talk about discernment a lot, or at least, you know, in the church we do, I do, that's what I do all day long, like talking to guys about discerning the priesthood, discerning their vocation. So we talk a big game about discernment when it comes to like big decision, you know, if you're going to get married, if you're going to go into the, you know, seminary, if you're going to go on mission, if you're going to, whatever, okay, and we seek the Lord's will, and you know, you have spiritual direction and things like that. But then when it comes to more mundane decisions, specifically further along in life you go, are you going to take this job over that job? Are you going to ask for a raise? Are you going to you know, try to maybe get out of one line of work or another line of work? Do you move to another city? Like those decisions and choices are equally important. Um, and for Christians, they're, they're deeply important, right? They have a huge ramification for oneself, one's family. But sometimes we don't approach them in the same, the same uh, posture of mind, right? We don't, we don't call that discernment necessarily. So what we want to do is kind of just put those two ideas together. The whole idea of Christian discernment, how, how do you discern? How do you approach these big life decisions? Uh, specifically looking at job, career, and vocation in that sense, right? What is my, what is my job in the world? Okay. Um, so why do we discern some choices and not others? And then secondly, um, Jay kind of brought this up. When we talk as Christians, are there some choices that we leave up to the will of God and other choices that are just, we're just kind of at our own device, you know, our, you know, left our own devices with how we figure it out. In other words, does God just tell us to figure it out? Well, I don't think that that's true, you know? Um, so how do we discern the work that we do? So I'm going to start off with kind of like a, a general, not a, not a great textbook definition of discernment. And then we'll come back around and try to, you know, apply that, which is basically this discernment in just in a normal sense, but in for, in for Christian, this is true too. Discernment is essentially responsibility in front of reality. So to stand in front of reality, not, not the way you think things ought to be or the way they might be, the way they should be, but to stand in front of the way things are responsibly, to respond to what's right in front of you. And obviously for, that's true for any person and for Christian, it's the same, but there's a, there's a, there's a depth to it right? A, because we see deeper into reality than non-Christians do. And B, we respond with greater responsibility, right? God is expecting something from us. And that's, you know, that's like a lot of the young guys that I work with and young women too. I work with some women, some young women. Uh, that's what we have to constantly kind of bring them back to, right? Discernment's not projecting what you want and trying to make it happen. It's looking first at, at reality. What are, the, what are all the factors and then how do, how do you feel called to respond to them? Okay, so a couple of problems. So if that's what discernment is, a couple of problems when we think about things like job, career, and all the decisions that go with it. The first is, is simply, and, and I think the people in the room re reflect this, that you're at a very different stage at different stages of life. So the way an 18 year old who goes to college, you know, and the counselor says, all right, what do you wanna study? What job path do you wanna commit yourself to? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? That's a very different question than a 25 year old who's like, trying to settle down and get married and is trying to figure out how his job is going to help him do that. A 35 year old, a 45 year old, a 65 year old. So the, 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 the question is very, very different based on where we are in life. And the people in the room kind of reflect that. So just a couple of, you know, not an exhaustive list, but think about young people, right? So how do young people approach the whole question of job and career? Uh, you know, there's the, what do I want to do question? People ask you, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What are you interested in? Like when I was when I was in college, I worked with campus ministry at Mount St. Mary's and I worked with a lot of college kids and it drove me crazy because they were they were so deep in that culture. What do you want to do? Like, oh, I really want to study criminal justice. So, wow. 
why do you want to study criminal justice? Well, because like, you know, a counselor met with me and told me about all the job possibilities, you know, in Westminster, Maryland to work in that field. And, and that was it. You didn't go any deeper than that, you know? So that's, that's, that's a very unreliable starting point for you. What do you want to do? I don't know what I want to do because I haven't lived enough a life to know what I'm capable of or what there is to do. So a lot of young people feel these choices kind of like a whole hallway of open doors and you could go through any door in the hallway, but you don't know which one to choose. Okay. So you kind of have that, that paralysis in front of too many options. Uh, there's also kind of a phenomenon with young people of just disillusionment with career in general. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a lawyer, kind of middle-aged guy, and he was actually surprisingly agreeing with this, you know? So middle-aged people tend to look at young people, millennials, or even like Gen Z people, you know, they're lazy. They don't want to commit to careers. They don't want to settle down. But the point is, is that economics has changed in 20 years. And so education is, is, is you know, grossly inflated compared to what it was. Housing is, is different, right? And so young people are, they're not, the, the standard kind of like get an education, get a job, make a career, that standard path just doesn't work the same way it did 20 years ago. And a lot of, a lot of young people are just disillusioned, right? Why do I wanna to commit to a career path that's not gonna be fulfilling to me, that's not gonna be lucrative, that's gonna make me change my plans. Um, and then also we, we talked about this kind of last night, a lot of young people kind of depend on where you're at, have the problem of what do you prioritize, relationship or career, right? Can you, can you focus on relationships, getting married, and then worry about career, right? Or do you have to kind of get all your ducks in a row, get the career, and then decide to get married? So, you know, like marriage and career very often feel like they're, they're kind of exclusive paths. You got you to commit to one or the other. Um, all right, so what about like middle-aged people or people who are already kind of begun the path of life career-wise, family-wise? So then you have basically the problem of conflicting priorities. So, and this is a lot of discussions we've had in the last couple of um, the last couple of months. What is the top priority when you're making decisions? Is it what's good for the family, right? We're gonna we're gonna live we're gonna get a job so I can live in this town because we want to be close to our family. We want to have good schools. Is it money, right? We're gonna take another job where we can get you know we can get everybody all the kids on health on the on the health benefits. We can make an extra couple thousand, we can kind of be, you know, relax a little bit. Um, is it job quality, right? Do you, do you, can, are you capable of working a job in an environment that's not, you know, that's not good for you? That's not, you're not doing the kind of work that you were educated to do. So can you put that away for the sake of providing for your family, right? So in other words, is the whole point of the job just to put bread on the table or is there something more? So you have this whole idea about the decisions I make ongoing, they're usually conflicting priorities. Uh, and then how do you not just kind of fall into an idea of maintenance? We've already started on this path. How do we maintain where we're at? And then you have the question of, am I missing out on opportunities that I should be taking? Am I really living up to my potential professionally? Am I, am I really honoring family obligations, right? So you're just trying to kind of maintain rather than look for something better. And then there's the experience of older people. Uh, like my parents are facing retirement. And you have the whole question of retirement is a financial a financial problem, but there's also the whole family problem that comes with that. You know, how are we going to prioritize our time? How are we going to be useful to the community? Right? Do you just retire and like go play putt putt golf for the next twenty years? Right? There was a certain time in America in which that was kind of upheld as the the ideal. Right? Like my grandfather retired from the steel mill, got a union pension, and then went fishing because that's what you did in 1970. You know. Um, Okay, so there's lots of different questions that people come based on their experience. So just to kind of summarize, there's some, there's a, there's a great, uh, we, we talk about this with our guys in seminary. This is uh, St. Francis de Sales, and then the, the contemporary writer Jacques Philippe kind of picks this up, whatever. Then we talk about discernment. Discernment is essentially prudence, right? It's, it, should be, it should be supernatural, it should, should be prayerful, but it's, it's prudence. Ordering different means to a given end. What's good, better, and best, you know, in my life. And one of the most crippling things for a person in discernment is anxiety, right? So like if, if you're full of anxiety, you're not able to really, to really discern, you know? So what are some of the anxieties that people have right now facing jobs? All these questions, like, am I missing out on an opportunity? So I chose to go to this school or I chose to pursue this job. Is there something else out there 
that's better and I'm not open to it, I'm missing out. So this is the FOMO anxiety, right? My students are, are, are full of that all the time. Uh, there's the question, am I not meeting my potential? Am I settling for this job because it's got great health benefits, but it's not good for me, right? Are we settling for this job because we're just too attached to the place we live? Right? Am I not living up to my potential as a person, professionally, so on and so forth? And then there's the whole idea about relationships. Right? Is, is my work causing me to neglect my children? Or as, I, as your parents get older, neglect your parents? Or are we prioritizing career in a way that, that doesn't allow us to make the kind of investment in friends and family that we want? Or vice versa, am I investing too much in relationships that aren't really lasting, right? You spent 10 years in a company investing in the people you work with, investing in the company, and then you get laid off or then it's a dead end, right? And you, you, you invested all of this time, talent, treasure, you know, blood, sweat, and tears when you could have been doing something else. And then there's, of course, just the regular financial problems, right? There's just the regular insecurity that causes anxiety. Okay, so all of this is background to ask the question, why work? Okay, so all that's introductory. Why work? So to answer that question, we want to break it down into like, what is work? Why do you work? And then the how question, that's very philosophical, right? You got to know what something is, then you got to know why it is, then you kind of know like what to do with it, how to do it. So what is work? Why should we care about it? Why is it a priority? And then the how is going to be kind of discernment. How do we, not how do we work, but how do we approach work uh, in terms of discernment. So the, the, the question, the subtitle to Jay's um, title, why work? Is it more than merely making a living, right? Is work more than just providing for the necess my necessities, necessities of my family? Is it more than just putting bread on the table? Well, I'll say the answer to that question is very obvious because if it were only making a living, then none of us would be here, right? It's very simple. If, my, if, work, if work was just about paying the bills, then it's not a very problematic thing, right? Except maybe in like the, the, the basis economic sense. So we're here because we know instinctively that work is more than just paying the bills, right? If, it, if that's all it was, you wouldn't be talking to me. You'd be talking to like a financial planner, right? Someone who actually knows something about money, which I don't know anything about money, right? Because I don't have any money and I never had to like pay a lot of bills. So we know instinctively that our jobs, our careers are more than just paying the bills. Okay, so if that's the case, then, then what really is work? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to um, John Paul II's encyclical, 1981, uh, Labrum Exergens on work, right? So if you never read it, a lot of it's very confusing. I reread it today. I still don't understand most of it. But essentially what John Paul does is he does two things that are important for us. He, he points back to the biblical account of work in Genesis, which he thinks is important for any person in any time, right? It's not just for Hebrew people, not just for agrarian people, but any man and woman, not even Christians, any man and woman at any time, you know, the, the biblical account of man and woman's vocation to work is significant. And secondly, he proposes what he calls the spirituality of work which he thinks the church should be fostering and teaching to people. He thinks the family should be teaching, so on and so forth. So I'm going to kind of go through some points of that. So first of all, Genesis, right? Genesis, that man and, women, man and woman were created to be workers and to be co-workers. So they're told to be fruitful and multiply. They're told to subdue the earth and to bring forth fruit. And this is before the fall, before they're cast out of Eden. What is Adam doing in the garden? He's working. So you can say, in the beginning, man was... A gardener. I talk to my students all the time. They want to go pull weeds. So, yeah, this is this is what we were supposed to do in the beginning. Man was a gardener, okay, and in doing so, he's becoming what he was created to be, right? He's he's kind of full, he's filling out what it means to be in the image of God. God creates a garden, right, and governs it, plants it, brings about fruit, and so men and women are given that to participate in. And then the fall happens, and uh, work the character of work changes so you remember in the scriptures it says that from now on man will earn his bread by the sweat of his face and that the earth is going to bring forth thorns and thistles okay so what john paul says is that that doesn't mean that work becomes cursed right but rather that work becomes a participation in the paschal mystery so that's coming 
right? So work is not a pure, unadulterated good that involves toil and involves struggle. And by becoming a man, and specifically by becoming a working man, God shows a new, a new, a new dimension to work, right? Jesus was a worker. Okay, so I want to go through a couple of distinctions that the Pope makes, and maybe they're kind of helpful to clarify our thinking. So John Paul, when he talks about the spirituality of work, he talks about work in, in two ways. First, as a participation in uh, the work of creation. So when we work, doesn't matter what kind of job that is, when we work, we ought to be cooperating with kind of filling out creation. And he says, secondly, the second aspect is work as a participation in the redemption. And this is, and to be fair, he doesn't say a lot about this. This is kind of spooky stuff. So when we work well, we are co-creating with God. And secondly, when we work well, specifically through that toil, that Paschal mystery, we're actually participating in the, an act of redemption. Okay, so what does that mean? We'll have to get to that. And then secondly, another distinction that he makes is very important. He says, anytime we talk about work, there are two different spheres of values, he calls them or two ways to consider work. We can consider work objectively, the objective value of work, or the subjective value of work. So what does that mean? The objective value of work is this, that whatever kind of work you're doing, right, is worthwhile because of the work itself. If you make chairs, that's a good thing. Why? Because chairs are good, right? If you, you know, if you teach, if you're a teacher, you teach kids, is that good? Yes. Why? Because the act of education or teaching is good. So work justifies itself because it itself is good. It's producing something. It's contributing something. It's shaping something. But he says this, the second aspect of work is the subjective value. In other words, work is not good only because of what it produces. It's good because of what it does to us, right? The way that it transforms the worker. And John, you don't have to go through all this the historical stuff, but John Paul says in in, in the last hundred years or so in our present day, there's always a temptation to value, to have a kind of a materialistic economic reduction of work so that work is only valuable for, right, for the bottom line, right? And he says, and, and when, when, you, when you get to that point, you're no longer talking about the good of the worker himself, right? And he says, for a Christian, the, the subjective value of work always has to be the most important. Man does not exist for the Sabbath, the Sabbath exists for man. In the same way, work does not exist, or man does not exist for work. Work exists for man, right? Work is good for us because it transforms us. So just, I mean, briefly, to kind of take a, a little short tangent, you can kind of think about that. You can think about people in your life when people don't have work to do or when their work is not fulfilling or when the work is not meaningful, that, that does something to the person. It holds them back right? You can think about people in your own, you know, personal history. The, the other day, I, I rewatched uh, the great uh, show, The Man for All Seasons, remember that? About St. Thomas More. And there's a great, there's that character, uh, Richard Rich, like a young guy. He's always hanging around Thomas's house. He's looking sad. And Thomas says, you know, Richard, you know, ask anything you want, and I'll do it for you. And he says, employ me, right? give me a job. Tom says, no, I'm not going to give you a job, right? Don't go into politics because you're, 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 you're too ambitious and you got no integrity. Go be a teacher. But you can set in, in Richard's character that until he has a job, he's not a person. He's just a hanger, a hangers on, right? And so we know that, that the, first, the first effect of work is it, it transforms the person, right? So John Paul will go on to talk about kind of three levels of this subjective dimension of work. So first, work transforms the worker. It takes a person from a, like a potential person and makes them into a real individual. And we know that a person only realizes their responsibility, their gifts, their talents when they're put to work. Secondly, there's the, the family dimension. We don't exist just as individual people satisfying our needs that we exist in families. So John Paul will say, work is the condition for family life. You want a family? You gotta have a job, right? You gotta work to have a family that work creates the condition for meeting other people's needs because your kids don't work, right? They don't, okay? So you got to work. But then also, so uh, the family is, becomes the condition for more work, All right? So you see how that works. So that work creates the possibility of a family life, but then family life itself becomes the jumping off point for a wider, a wider world of work. And then the third level, after the family, like this, the social of society, 
the fact that we have work means that we can have a common good. We can have a society. You know, we pay taxes not just to build roads, that we exist like our labor is interconnected. It's interdependent. So by work, we enter into the, wor the, the world of politics in a good sense, right? Uh, when, you, when you get a job, you suddenly start caring about, you know, uh, uh, property taxes. You know, you start voting, you start recycling, you know. There's a whole kind of like political change that happens in a person because they begin working and now they're participating in something bigger than them. Uh, there's a whole kind of entering into an inheritance that you have only through work. Okay, so these three spheres, so we are changed on an individual level, kind of on a family level, on a, on a, on a wider political social level through the work that we do. Okay, so work doesn't just satisfy our needs, it's supposed to transform us. So all of that is basically what he means by work as a cooperation in creation. That we are, you know, the world will cease to be a habitable place if we stop working. But then he goes on and he says, but the other thing you got to remember is that work is also a, a participation in redemption. That is the Paschal mystery, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus, which is a very bizarre thing to think about. And again, he doesn't say a lot about this. It's very spooky. But he goes back to the whole idea of toil, that for men and women living in this fallen world, work is full of injustice. It's full of unfairness. It's full of toil. It's full of suffering. Now, for a Christian, that's not necessarily a bad thing because wherever we see suffering, we should see a, a, an invitation to imitate Jesus, right? To enter into the world of suffering. So I'll kind of leave this to you to kind of figure out what this means like in your own life. But essentially, this means that work isn't just about augmenting myself, right? Giving myself new skills, giving myself, you know, satisfying my needs. In a lot of ways, work is my way of surrendering to circumstances that are painful. It's my way of not just passively or in a detached way, kind of going to the flow, but freely allowing myself to be shaped, you know, by forces outside of myself. Like my guys, my young guys, they don't, they don't understand that at all, right? They kind of start to figure that out. When you commit to work, you hand yourself over, right? And there's a, that's a, there's a form of suffering. And somehow that's, that's transformative of us. And then the other aspect of that too, he says, you know, we also believe in a new heavens and a new earth, which will be eternal. And the new heavens and new earth is not something that's going to drop out of the sky. It's something that's going to rise up from this heavens in this earth. So the work that we do not do here and now will not be able to be transformed in the new heavens and new earth. Right? That should be a very sobering thought, right? That the, what the, the you know what we will be for all eternity is a, an, a, a flowering, right? An outgrowth, a perfection of what we are now. So the work we do now has an eternal significance. I mean, and if, in, in, you know, if you, as soon as you have kids, this should be clear to you, right? You, you, have, you have kids, you raise kids, boom. That's, that's something with eternal consequences right there. But do we have that same mentality? We think about the ordinary work we do. You go to work, you pay bills, you make a product, you make a business deal. Somehow that's, um, forming material matter that will be taken up into the new heavens and new earth. Okay, so we'll end, we'll end with this. So if this is true, then it should be clear why we work. We don't have to work, right? It's not the necessities of the body that propel us to work. It's really a true vocation. God has called us to be workers. And it, that's not, a, you know, that's not a, 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 a calling that we should, we should shrink from. So how do we discern? If we go back to the definition, if discernment is responding to reality, which is very confusing or can be very kind of painful or not ideal, or whatever, how do, we re how do we respond freely and consciously to reality? Okay, so a couple of points. First, to ask the question itself is a very good first start. So I told this friend of mine, this lawyer friend of mine, I said, yeah, I got to go to this parish. We got to talk about discerning work. And he's like, really? I said, yeah, that's what they want to talk about. And he says, man, that's, I wish I would have done that, you know, years ago, rather than just have some college counselor tell me what I'm supposed to do. So just to notice that, to even know that it's something that could be discerned is a big first step. Secondly, that we, we kind of have, we have to avoid two dichotomies, quietism and activism. So quietism is basically like, I'm just going to pray and the Lord is just going to show me the job I should take. 
or the person I should marry or the house I should live in. Right? Well, that, that, that kind of violates my freedom, right? God needs me to, to pray and then needs me to act. But then the other side, we have activism, which is essentially, I'm just going to do what I think is smart and just hope that it's what the Lord wants, but I can just kind of create the path as I go. Okay. So both of these are not true discernment. Third point reality. And this goes, this goes back to what we were talking about uh, yesterday. The reality is fundamentally good, right? St. Paul says that all things work for the good of those who love God, that all of creation serves the one who loves God. We really believe that. So reality might be difficult, arduous, might be painful, it might be confusing, but it's ultimately good, ultimately good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to steal Grace's example. Is that okay, Grace? Okay. So Grace was sharing that, that like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go take this internship. I'm going to go take this job. I'm going to take a risk. Okay. And I don't know if this is going to be a great experience, if this is going to be a terrible experience, a painful experience, a difficult experience, but either way, it's going to be a good experience, right? Either way, there's good. And I think that's the whole idea of the arduous, right? You don't know what you're going to find when you get there, but committing to the journey will end up for my good. So that's the first thing. So reality can be very difficult, very confusing, but it has to be good. Otherwise, we can't, you, know, you can't jump in the pool if you're still deciding, is it, is it going to burn my skin off or is it going to be cool and refreshing? When you jump in a cold pool, it might be shocking, right? But it's not going to kill you. You got to know that before you jump in the pool. Um, and then secondly, my response to reality, responding to what's right in front of me cannot be merely a yes or a no, you know? Like, do you want this? Yes or no? You make a decision right now. That my response is, is free. It's creative, right? And I think a lot of young people kind of feel this way. They, they, they're, they're, they're given too many options, okay? But one way to get rid of too many options is I give you two options. Do you want to go left or do you want to go right? And sometimes we do that with ourselves. We, we reduce everything down to a dichotomy, left or right, yes or no. You say, no, what God, what God might be inviting me to or how I'm responding to this is not this or this, but maybe a third way. Maybe I have to make the way rather than choose a path that's already given to me. So we have to, we have to know that our response could be creative. And then third of all, our response is not once and for all. We we're talking about this last night, that the choices, it's all right, that our freedom, our response to whatever's in front of us is not once and for all, but it's dynamic and it's continuous through time. So what does that mean? The choices that we make are shaped by the circumstances of the present. Right? You want to go to college, but you got, you know, you got straight Fs. Okay, great. Can't go to college. That's not open to you, right? That's just a circumstance. That choice is, is shaped by the circumstances of the present. So you go do something else. But as soon as we act, as soon as we choose, as soon as we put ourselves forward, we start making new circumstances, right? And those circumstances now become the conditions for other choices. So our choices shape the conditions for, for future choices. Now, this can be really scary. You can, you can get paralyzed by that, right? The choice I made 10 years ago to do this or not do that, that's what put me in this situation. Well, that, that could be tragic. But that's where we gotta, So we got to think about very clearly, but the choices I make now are going to set me up in 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years, right? So my freedom is always kind of dynamic. It's always kind of moving. Once we start choosing, we commit ourselves, those commitments themselves become the new realities that we have to face. I think this becomes really important thing about family, right? You choose to get married. Okay, now everything else that you're going to do has that as the background reality. You have a kid. Okay, that's the new reality, right? Uh, you, you know, you commit to a job, you go to the job and it, it ends up not being what you want. Fine, but that's the reality. You committed to that. Okay. So to conclude, Include, what, is this, what does this mean? You know, this is maybe unhelpful. It doesn't answer the question, but maybe it frames our thinking that to discern if it really does mean to stand in front of reality and to respond to reality, that means we can't exclude any piece. And it seems so very often that when we talk about job or talk about career, we only talk about one piece, the money piece, the family piece, the personal fulfillment piece, you know, the, the career option piece, um, or we focus entirely on the object right the work itself or entirely on the subject me what i want you know what fulfills me what's good for me um and i think for this reason we constantly fall back into standard ways of thinking right 
and I, to, to mean to without any prejudice to anybody, I would say like to young people, like young people have to feel free to face the realities of job and career in ways differently than their parents did. It's very difficult for a parent, as some of y'all y'all know, right? You, you see your children making the choices and decisions that you never would have made, that didn't wouldn't make any sense 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, so I think we need to be unafraid to kind of face, face reality as it is now, here, not as it used to be, or as it might be, or as it could be. Okay, so I'll, we'll close. We'll close with that, and uh, and go to questions. For the people yeah, I'll respond. I'll re like so I'm going to repeat his question for the Zoom people. So, so Benedetto says that yeah, we, we think about it in pieces: the job, the money piece, the family piece, all these pieces. But another way to think about it is balance, right? That the, the the solution is to kind of get all the pieces in the right proportion, you know. But you're saying that even that, even finding the, the right work-life balance, you know, work-family balance, even that is not satisfying because what you really want is all of it. You want the, I want 100% investment in family, 100% investment in a good paying job that's a fulfilling job, that's a meaningful job, like you want it all. And so you're saying maybe there, maybe balance, maybe we've been sold a bill of goods, maybe balance isn't the goal. Maybe we should, we should want more. We should want 100%. So... My initial thought to throw that out, just that's, I don't think this is a total answer, but one, one possibility is that the tension, the tension that exists when we want 100% and we can't achieve 100%, I think that that has to be part of the death and resurrection. That has to be part of what John Paul is talking about, the toil of work, right? In other words, on the one hand, you should want 100%. On the other hand, you can't you can't achieve that by figuring out the right kind of situation, and that's necessarily painful. And the way that a person responds to that suffering, I think, has to matter. Um, so, I mean, just to you know, so another what, what, what we don't want to say is, look, Benedetto, like you want too much, you know, you need you just need to just you're too idealistic. You can't have everything. You can't have a perfect job that's going to fulfill you as a person and pay you a bunch of money and have health insurance and get vacation with the kids you got to choose you can't like that that's too much we don't want to say that however there has to be some suffering built into the thing right so in other words to 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 hope for and to work for to strive for that wholeness and that intensity to keep that alive while at the same time responding to the reality as it is is necessarily painful so in other words, it's not a problem. I don't think what John Paul is saying, like, I don't think it's a problem to solve. Like the reason why you don't have this hundred percent is just because, you know, you haven't found the right situation. Cause then what happens? Then you're constantly saying, well, maybe this job will give me what I really want. Maybe, you know, this situation will, will finally allow me to use all my gifts, whatever. Um, but part of, part of what you're committing to in any job, part of your committing to is the suffering, you know, um, I remember when I was, when I was a young guy, when I was like real young, like 19, I was with this priest and I, we we're talking about gifts. And I said, oh yeah, if God gives you a gift, then like, he wants you to use that for your good to go to the church. And he's like, yeah, what if he doesn't though? What if, what if God wants you to just bury it? I was like, well, that, that's not how God works, right? If God gives you a gift, like he wants you to use it. And he's like, well, he was like 35. He's like, I don't know, man. Sometimes, sometimes you really want to use a gift and sometimes it's just not the right time and you just bury it. You know, and I, I thought he was very cynical and very, you know, but now that I'm older, it's totally true. Right? Sometimes you really want, you want something, you want to do something and you got to just sit on it. And that's, that's painful. It's painful to do that without becoming cynical, you know. I mean, I think like, like on the one hand, on the one hand, there's a tendency, there's a tent or there could be a tendency for Christians to say that like what I like what I do in church, you know, the work that I do at mass, you know, prayer, that matters for all eternity. But what I do at the office, not so much. Or if, or if it does matter, it only matters because I take I take my money from that and I go do something with it. Or, you know, like there's a certain tendency to, to devalue secular work. And I think that to do that is to devalue grace, to devalue baptism, right? That like 90% of a lay person's holiness is lived out doing secular work. 
you know, so you can think about like Jose Maria Escrivá, you know, and the way we sanctify work through our intention. That's a big part of it. But we don't want to say is that it only becomes holy work because you're, you know, you're praying, you know, like, like mission to charity, you need mopping floors, but you got to be praying the rosary while you mop the floor, you know, and if you're praying the rosary while you mop the floor, then mopping becomes a, a holy thing. Well, no, I mean, you know, the grace of baptism is such that anything a Christian puts their hand to, and they do so as a Christian, that is like with faith, should be a holy thing, right? Should be a holy task. So, yeah, so grace should be operating in everything that we do, you know, in the office, business, even if it's totally under the surface, right? So grace, grace operates best almost when it's invisible, you know? Uh, but to, say, to speak to what you're talking about specifically with discernment, I don't know. I mean, you know, quietism is one thing, activism is, is one thing, but I'm not against, you know, prayerfully asking the Lord, you know, should I, should I take this job? Should I not pray about it, make a novena and then, and then act, you know, that could look like quietism from a certain point of view, it could look like activism from a certain point of view, or it could look like really trusting that that the Holy Spirit operates, you know, in our prayerful decisions. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. I don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at, but like I think I think grace is 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 present, but it's very kind of invisible. Like it's not a third factor. It's not a third, it's not another card on the table. It like is the table. <clears throat> when you say secular criteria, you mean like like secular standards of yeah. judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, so like standards of success or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so her question essentially is like, like she's saying, like she's not afraid of secular work. Like she's not afraid that as a Christian, I can, I can engage in secular work. It's meaningful. You know, it, it transforms me, but how do I know that, that other, you know, secular or I say worldly, worldly uh, values or standards are coming in. So how do I value, how do I judge what, whether I'm doing good work, because the world would judge that very differently, right? Based on salary or based on performance review or something like that, whatever. Yeah, I think I think two things. I think first, <clears throat> and John Paul kind of mentions this, he talks about the spirituality of work and specifically families being like a school to teach work, you know, a school for, for work or something. Um, I think it's very important that Christians have like a deep sense of, um, like a deep sense of the value of work themselves, right? Um, because the world has different values, right? Um, so if I don't, if I don't come into a situation or a job very convicted about like what I'm, what makes for meaningful work, what makes for good work, yeah, then I can't not take someone else's values, you know, for my own. So I think that's that's the, kind of the first thing. Uh, so yeah, there's, so there's a discernment there. There's a discernment there of like, I got into this kind of thinking, I got into this because I wanted to do good work because I wanted to do this. And here I am five years later, and I'm kind of caught up in this rat race of thinking, you know, uh, and maybe that, and maybe when you see the, the discrepancy, that becomes the opportunity to make a change. You say, okay, the longer I'm in this, the more I'm, you know, I can't, I can't do this job without thinking about, you know, for instance, like think about a certain competitive spirit. You work for a company that's competitive. It's okay. If you want to, if you want to really do this job, like you've got to kind of take on this kind of cutthroat attitude. And you say, well, this is, I don't, don't want to do this, but I'm saying, but that's only going to rise because you feel the, the disparity to begin with. Right. Um, yeah. And the second thing is that, is that maybe that's also part of the painful tension that by, by turning us into the by turning christians out into the world to work the lord does in some sense abandon us to the values of the world which is which is kind of painful you know um so there's going to be collision or conflict between you know i mean i mean like my my, my parents are small business owners so a lot of this i know just from watching my, my parents and like it's they, they've been deeply disillusioned many times by what they view as you know cutthroat dishonest it's not illegal, but just that's not honest work. And, and, and the, the, the pain of like, well, if, if we really wanted to like, if we really want to secure the business, we could very easily kind of compromise, but what do you do? Okay. Well, you know, so we end up kind of having a financially problematic business simply because we're not willing to work with certain doctors who do certain practices that we don't think are, you know, um, 
so yeah, that's so those two things. I think that's like, you'll know the difference because you carry within yourself the criteria for what makes for good work and you feel the, the disparity. And then secondly, that's maybe that's part of the tension. Maybe that's part of the suffering. I mean, I mean prudence, just like classically speaking, prudence is decision-making, ordering good, better, and best, right? So prudence, you already have the goal. I already know this is the goal, but then I have all these different means. You, know, you choose A, B, C, or D. And so prudence, prudence is the ability to kind of like not, not analyze and think, but it's the ability to just intuitively feel or see what's the best. So, I mean, prudence is the political virtue. It's the virtue of parenting. It's the virtue of management. Like it's huge, right? The ancients believe that, you know, um, the sales makes a big deal about the Christian prudence. But the important thing to remember that prudence is based on experience. So there's no way that you can know good, better, and best until you've seen a lot of good, better, and best. And that implies that you made a lot of mistakes. Remember, this is why Aristotle says you can't teach ethics to young people because they don't know prudence because they've never, they don't have enough experience. They never messed up, you know? So even that, that you gain prudence a lot of times by making, making bad decisions, okay. you know? Um, yeah, and then, and then the, the point, the, point that the, the other point about anxiety is that anxiety paralyzes prudence and you, you you've all experienced that you don't explain that that you know you got a b and c on the table which one's gonna be better if you got anxiety what does that mean that means that you've got something else you're thinking about right mm -hmm. so the, some other criterion or some other thing that's that's coming in and so you know anxious people are not looking at reality right they're mm -hmm. they're they're projecting something or that you know like there's something there's not a peaceful relationship with with what's in front of you and so yeah, I, I don't know exactly where he says that, but the sales does say like anxiety is like the worst thing a person can face, especially when they're trying to make a fruit decision. 